This case will talk about a mysterious crime that happened weeks before Christmas 2007 in Florida, United States. Nancy and Joey Bocicchio were found lifeless in a car in a shopping mall parking lot, and evidence left by the person responsible do not lead the police in a specific direction. However, for those who watched the Israel Keys case that I released few days ago, I ask you to pay close attention to these facts, try to connect the dots, and tell me if this could possibly be a crime committed by him. This is the story of Nancy and Joey Bocicchio. Nancy Bocicchio was born on August 21st, 1960 in New York, and for many years dedicated her life to work. She was the kind of person who didn't stop, for those who know New York and have seen the buzz of the city, you can imagine what life is like there. Nancy woke up early, had lunch on the run, slept late, did a thousand things at the same time, and because she was very communicative, she was always talking, laughing and joking. Nancy graduated in economics and worked on Wall Street as a stock exchange consultant. She spent most of her career moving from company to company as she rose to greater roles. She was financially generous with her family, but she also thought about the future and saved to ensure her retirement. The dream of most New Yorkers is to enjoy retirement in Florida. The reason many people move there is for the calm and the climate, but Nancy decided not to wait for old age to arrive. She believed that life should be lived, but at the same time there would be no point in working so hard if she wasn't going to be able to enjoy it. So, in 1995, at the age of 35, Nancy decided it was time to start slowing down. When a colleague quit her job and moved to Boca Raton, Florida, she decided to do the same thing. Nancy also dreamed of being a mother, and if motherhood happened for her, she would like to enjoy every moment in a calmer and safer place than the madness of New York. At that time, she was dating Philip Hauser, a lawyer based in Brooklyn, and it was not easy to convince him to move to Florida. So at first, Nancy decided to go alone and thought that having a long-distance relationship would be the deciding factor as to whether Philip would relocate to Florida. Upon finding out that Philip wasn't going, Nancy's sister Joanne and her husband Stan Bruno decided to move with her. They were already planning to move to Florida eventually and decided to go earlier than planned so as not to let Nancy go alone. Nancy bought a four-bedroom house in Boca Raton in a high-end condominium called Hidden Lake and her sister and Stan bought another house also in the same area. She wanted a big house because she planned to host her family who lived in New York during the holidays and also because she really wanted to have children. She and Philip maintained their long-distance relationship and in early 1999, Nancy became pregnant. Nancy was already 39 years old and due to high blood pressure, her doctor advised against continuing with the pregnancy, but she ignored the advice and went ahead with the pregnancy. Philip did not want to have children, but supported Nancy in her decision. The due date given by the obstetrician was December 25th, 1999, Christmas Day. So, upon discovering that her baby would be a girl, Nancy decided to name her Joey Noel. Joey, in honour of her father who was called Joe, and Noel, because she would be her Christmas angel. However, little Joey decided to come into the world a few days early, on December 17th. The birth was peaceful, and Nancy's dream had finally been fulfilled. Philip travelled to Florida as soon as he found out about his daughter's birth, and upon arriving at the hospital and seeing Joey in the maternity ward and Nancy sleeping in the room, he ran to a jewellery store and bought a diamond ring for Nancy and a heart bracelet for Joey. Then he came back to the hospital and asked Nancy to marry him. They got married three months later. Philip continued to work in New York, 
but spent practically half his time in Florida. He and Nancy were excellent parents and Joey grew up in a very loving home. But all that love didn't just come from her parents, but also from her aunt and uncle, Joanne and Stan. The family was very united and they did everything together. As she spent a lot of time with adults, Joey was one of those forward-thinking children. She was very playful, funny and communicative like her mother was at that age. But she also knew how to respect everyone. She greeted everybody who passed by, talked slowly, and Aunt Joanne says that Joey sometimes didn't even seem like a child. She wasn't fussy about food. She ate things that other young children wouldn't eat. For example, she loved seafood, Thai food, lamb and salad. The family frequented a fine restaurant in Boca Raton called Casa D'Angelo, and every time Joey arrived, the waiters came to greet her, and the restaurant owner asked to bring a portion of oysters to the table. He was amazed to see such a little girl eating something that many adults don't even eat. In 2003, Philip and Nancy amicably separated. He moved back to New York full-time, but saw Joey on Skype practically every day. Regardless of being physically separated, the two got along well, had great respect and admiration for each other, and shared the important role of parents together. In 2006, the divorce was finalised, but at that time, the couple were contemplating reconciliation. On December 12th, 2007, Nancy had picked up her daughter early from school to take her to an appointment with a cardiologist. Weeks before, a paediatrician had detected a heart murmur and recommended a specialist. The appointment was at one o'clock in the afternoon and Joey was to go to a friend's house at 3.30. So when they left the appointment, Nancy decided to stop by the mall. She needed to buy a graduation gift for a friend's niece and order Joey's birthday cake, which was in five days. To celebrate her eighth birthday, Joey had chosen the Casa D'Angelo restaurant as the venue. This choice came as a surprise to many parents, who hadn't imagined taking their children to a fine restaurant like this for a party, but not to those who already knew Joey. The waiters nicknamed her the future mayor of Boca Raton. The restaurant owner was so flattered by the choice that he even prepared a special menu for the 12 children who would attend the party. After being at the mall for about 50 minutes, Nancy and Joey left and went to their car. Unfortunately, the two never returned home. Nancy had planned to call her sister in the afternoon to tell her how Joey's appointment with the cardiologist had gone. But she didn't do that and never answered Joanne's calls. From then on, we don't know what exactly happened. The little we do know is what security cameras and bank transactions were able to record. A few minutes after midnight, the mall's security guards noticed that there was a single car parked in the parking lot. They approached and noticed that the engine was running, but the car would not move. It was impossible to see who was inside. They called, but no one opened the door. According to the mall's rules, they couldn't open the vehicle, and that's why they ended up calling the police. Upon arrival, one of the agents used a probe to inspect the car. Everything seemed okay. Shortly afterwards, a second officer opened the front door, and when looking at the back seat, he saw the horrific scene that would become the city's nightmare for the next few weeks. In the back seat, mother and daughter had their wrists tied with sealing wax, diving goggles with insulating tape covering their eyes, and both had bullet holes in their foreheads. Officers immediately called for reinforcements and the entire area was cordoned off. Early in the morning, Joanne was having coffee with her husband and daughter and saw on the news that a robbery followed by murder had occurred at the mall. Without the newspaper giving the name or description of the victims, 
Joanne began to sense something was wrong and said she was sure it was her sister and niece. At 10.30am, the Boca Raton police contacted Joanne and gave her the bad news. Investigations showed that Nancy and Joey left the Sears door at 3.11pm. At 3.14, her cell phone made a call to 911. But shortly afterwards, the call was interrupted. Following emergency protocol, the 911 dispatcher called back and the call went to voicemail. At 3.19, a withdrawal of $500 was recorded on Nancy's current account. At 3.22, Nancy's car is seen entering the shopping centre car park again. Unfortunately, there were no CCTV cameras within the car park. No fingerprints were found on the car other than those of Joey and Nancy. The case quickly shocked the community. The despair was so great that the next day, the shopping centre was almost empty. For the police, the situation was not good either. The individual who kidnapped and murdered the two was well prepared. He meticulously planned the crime, studied the location, did everything very quickly and mainly without being noticed in one of the busiest places, a shopping centre on Christmas Eve. He thought about every step. He wore plastic seals, handcuffs. He probably wore gloves and left no evidence. He made visual restraints by wrapping diving goggles with duct tape and he had two goggles, one for Nancy, one for Joey and his gun most likely had a silencer. The first to be questioned was Philip, but he had solid alibis. In cases like this, the police never rule out the possibility that the crime could have been committed by the husband. He was not present at the scene. His partners and clients proved that he was in New York. There was also the theory that Philip could have hired a hitman to carry this out. However, as the investigation went deeper, Philip was ruled out as a suspect. Another reason for the police to believe that Philip had nothing to do with the crime was the fact that as terrible and macabre as this crime was, it was not the only one to happen in the same way, in the same place. Something very similar had happened to another mother and her baby in the car park of the same shopping mall four months earlier. On August 7th, 2007, a woman whose name the police keep confidential so let's call her Jane here, came to the police station in a state of shock reporting an incident. She said when she was walking in the shopping mall car park with her one year and eight month old son and after putting him into the car, a man approached her with a gun and kidnapped them, ordering her to drive far away. He said that if she did everything he told her, nothing would happen. He asked her to drive to an ATM there he made her withdraw $600, which was the limit for the day. After that, he gave her the coordinates of where he wanted to stop. They reached the back of a cafeteria and asked her to seat on the back seat. He handcuffed her, tied her hands to her son's car seat with a seal tape. He then tied her neck with more seal tape to the metal of the seat's headrest. After that, he placed a pair of dark glasses covered with electrical tape and began driving the car. When her mobile phone started ringing, he got angry and she told him not to worry because it was supposed to be the father of her son. She said they were divorced, that her ex was stalking her, and every time she didn't answer the phone, he tried to come after her. They were in fact divorced, but the stalking part was a lie. She just wanted a chance to talk on the phone. At this point, she thought he got scared. He let her take the call saying the car was broken down in Delray Beach and she should ask him to pick her up. Then he parked. They were actually on Delray Beach. He took her drive license from her bag, said that he now knew her name, where she lived, and he would come after her if she gave his description to the police. She had spent almost half an hour held by the neck, handcuffed, wearing diving goggles and with her son crying, waiting for her ex to arrive. Even though she was scared, 
Jane went to the police station and reported the kidnapper. Today, she is in the Witness Protection Service. She managed to change her name and address, and therefore her identity remains unknown. According to Jane, he was around 1.75 metres tall, had white skin, had no accent, was wearing a military-style hat and sunglasses. His hair was brown and he wore a ponytail at the back of his head. Any type of kidnapping, even short ones just for ATM withdrawals, are considered federal crimes in the USA, and the Boca Raton police, together with the FBI, began investigations into Jane's case, and this same team took over Nancy and Joey's case. They believed the same man to be responsible for both crimes. While in Jane's case, the only thing they had was a sketch, in Nancy's case, he would need to generate more evidence and soon more appeared. The criminal took some belongings from her car, including her mobile phone and credit card, which appeared a few days later in Miami. The people who found the items were questioned but later released the FBI truly believes they were not involved. In February of 2008, and you will understand now why I am highlighting 2008, an FBI criminal profiler draws a profile of the criminal. According to him, this is someone with military experience, as he not only wears a hat used by soldiers in the field, but also acts in a very precise way, characteristic of someone who served in the army. His initial purpose is only to rob, but he is not afraid to kill. In fact, he has killed before. He chooses his victims based on their vulnerability. Mothers with high purchasing power. That's why he chose that shopping centre and also those in the company of children, because he can gain total control over them through fear. He does not want to be identified in any way hence the diving goggles with duct tape. He commits other crimes and needs quick money. He likes the adrenaline that an abduction generates, otherwise he would only commit fraudulent crimes. He is not afraid of contact with the victim and takes pleasure in being in control. He is knowledgeable about the area, as he knew that the mall did not have cameras in the car park, only at the entrance and exit doors. The Boca Raton police released the profile of the criminal along with the sketch, offered rewards to anyone who brought information that would lead them to his identity. But despite all their efforts, to this day, they have not been able to officially identify who committed these crimes. This criminal profiler made this profile in 2008, and in 2012, when Israel Keyes was arrested, he told in detail how he acted. He, I mean Israel. And practically everything I said now matches several points what he used to do. For those who haven't yet seen the case I brought about, the link is here in the description of this episode. In relation to the list that the FBI released of the points where Israel was present in the long 16 years in which he was involved in crime, it is possible to find evidence that he passed through Boca Raton because, despite there being no direct link with the location, there is a possibility that he rented a car and drove a few kilometres to get where he wanted. Furthermore, Israel was an experienced burglar. The FBI confirmed eight bank robberies he committed and in none of these robberies did he kill anyone. It was with the money obtained from robberies that he financed his trips and the kit materials so that nothing would be noticed on his income tax or card transactions. The list that the FBI has of locations is based only on what Israel paid with his card or using his email address. That is, this list must be much larger. Looking at the sketch, it is also possible to suspect that it could be Israel Keys not only due to the choice of clothing and accessories, but also due to his physical features. Israel had somewhat long hair, which he could put in a small ponytail, but in a robbery he carried out on a small bank in New York, he had a fake moustache and a wig, while in another in Arizona, he had a long, fake beard and wig. That is, 
he also disguised himself. In the case of Jane and Nancy, the police tried to trace the brand of diving goggles, but it was a very popular brand that could be found anywhere, and this criminal did not leave any fingerprints as he was most likely wearing gloves. Israel always kept gloves and sunglasses in his kits, but believe it or not, Israel Keyes is not named as a suspect in these two crimes. In the year of Nancy and Joey's deaths, the houses on the street where they lived, which were already decorated for Christmas, took down their decorations as a way of expressing mourning. The Casa D'Angelo restaurant, which had hosted Joey's birthday party on the 17th, closed its doors that day. During the choir performance at the school where Joey attended, the students observed a minute of silence and read a tribute to her. Nancy and Joey's wake was at the same church where Joey was baptised. The reverend who led the wake was the one who should have been giving Joey her first communion just three months later. Instead, she was buried in the white dress that she was supposed to wear at the ceremony. What do you think about this case? Do you think Israel Keyes was responsible for these crimes? Leave your opinion in the comments and I'll see you in the next case. <laughs>